Well, what a blessing to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I tell you, we're going to we're going to start in our Bible study. We've we've been uh, in Philippians chapter number one, verses nine through eleven, and we're going to continue our 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 uh, message on growing spiritually. We've talked about the, the prayer of Paul, how it was a prayer that was something that, that, that was inside of him. It wasn't only by duty, but something that, that, that was in him to pray for, for the concern of, of the brethren and, the, and the, of the church. And boy, we need, a, we, need, we need a burdensome prayer like that today. We need to have a burden for one another, a burden for the church, and to pray for each other. But then we talked about uh, the basis of what our growth has to be based on, and that is love. Love is the greatest attribute of the Christian life. And love is that that distinguishes us apart from any other. And uh, we, we talked about that last week. And today we're going to continue that as we look at, in these verses once again. And I want to invite you to turn to Philippians chapter number 1 and verse number 9. We'll start reading once again. And it says, In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in the knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may prove things that are Excellent, that ye may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which, by, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray. Father, once again, I do thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray, God, that you'll help us as we look into it today, and Lord, that you would help us to grow spiritually. Lord, these fundamental truths that we have, I pray that you, you would help us to lay that foundation of a, of a spirit-filled life. Lord, we love you and thank you for all that you do for us. I do humble myself before you, realizing I'm just a man. And Lord, we need you. Lord, I pray you would have your will, and I'll praise you and give you the honor and the glory of everything that's said and done. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this prayer for Paul that he gives to the Philippian Christians is focused on the essentials of spiritual growth, spiritual growth, sound spiritual living. The elements of this spiritual life is something that a Christian must pursue. Can I tell you that, uh, that in our lives, we don't just learn how to, our, when we're, we get saved, we don't, we're, we're just not... Uh, completely filled with the, the, the love that we need to the extent that we need it. So there has to be a pursuing love. We must pursue love in our life. And it's not just uh, the love by which the world has, but the love by which the Bible dictates to us that we are to have in our lives. That love that is greater, that, that agape love, the love of will. It means that you will to love. You make yourself love. You, 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 it's not a choice to you. And we must have that in our lives because that is the love that God desires from us as believers in Christ. Now, last week we were talking about five elements by which Paul mentions in his prayer here and I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to ask you if you remember them. If I, could, uh, if I were to call on you, would you raise your hand? You wouldn't raise your hand, Mr. Jerry said, no, I won't. So that's why I'm going to call you out, Mr. Jerry. What is the, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding with you. <laughs> Those five elements. But the first is love. And then excellence. And then integrity good works, and glory. Now, this will be on the test, all right? Uh, 
I used to take a class from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lawson, and uh, he's, he, uh, he told us that uh, what he taught our class, he also taught his church. And at the same time he was teaching the class, he was, he was every, every Sunday night or, or Wednesday night, he would give that same, same lecture to his church. And at the end of the book, when we took our exam, they also had a paper that he passed out, and they took the exam also. So I, I, I was thinking about him and uh, think that y'all might need an exam after this. Amen? No, I'm just kidding. But uh, as we're studying these, these, these things, we, we learned it last week in verse number 9 that the essential of these five or the, the beginning of these five that we have here before us is love. It is named love. He says, I pray that your love will, may abound yet more and more. And the, we pointed out the last time that all Christian uh, lives begin with love. Begin with love. Well, we didn't become a Christian because, because we love God, but because God loved us. Christian life begins with love. You know, it is the foundation by which it is built upon. And we saw that in verse 9 through 11, there's a sequence by which takes place. Love leads to excellence. And excellence leads to integrity. And that integrity leads to good works, which leads to praise and glory to God. So love is the greatest foundation for the Christian life in, in, that we live. Love is that great foundation. We talked a lot about that. It, it surpasses all virtues of the Christian life. And, really, and in reality, it is the distinction of our faith. It reveals our faith. That is the greatest distinction of Christian and the sum and substance of all of it is the heart of love. God loved us. We love God. And in that text, we love each other and others love us. And that is the the rich distinction of Christianity. We love because he loved us. And love is the greatest thing. Love is that that surpasses the, the, the reality of all the expression of Christian living. True godliness begins with love. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 1, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, which is love, I become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. What tremendous words are given to us here. Nothing has any value unless there is love. That is what Paul is saying. So love is the sur surpassing virtue, and Paul then prays that this love of the, of the Philippians and us would abound more and more in all the real knowledge, and all discernment. He prays for our increasing love. Now, we noted last week several points about this love, and I want to cover them real quickly with you. As indicated in the fact that God, it is from God, because Paul asks God to give them this love. So it comes from God and not from man. They really have it. It, it is something that's, that, that's already there, 
but the desire is for it to abound more and more. It is a decisive love. It is the word agape, which means love of will, love of choice. It's not an emotion. It is that of choice, that that we will to do. It is a dynamic love that it abounds, increasing, increasingly, and flowing more and more. It is a deep love that is rooted deep inside of us, the spiritual knowledge of understanding of that love. And it is a discerning love that has an insight to all the, the things that partake in our lives. And that is the love. And this love is not an unregarded impulse. It is a biblical, discerning, discriminating service rendered to the others in need. It, is a, it, is, it, 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 it goes to the place of meaning sacrifice. It is not emotion, it is duty. It is an act of self-sacrifice on the behalf of someone else. It cannot, be, it cannot be reduced to an emotional feeling. The key to it is selflessness. Humility. And losing ourselves in meeting the needs of others. The, that, those are the keys to this love that we have that God has given to us. People who, really love, who are really committed to this love are unselfish, gracious to meet others' needs, no matter what their own is, no matter what the need might be. Everything begins with love. And Paul prays for this heart of love. Now let's go just a little bit further and look at the next word or excellence. Excellence. In verse number 10 it says, if you'll notice, it says that ye may prove things that are excellent. Proving things that are excellent. Now, I want you to notice the sequence here. This is further dealing with the, the previous uh, point that follows first love, then excellence. We know this because it says that ye. You're building upon that principle of love, the link that gives the progression of the the view here. When a person is literally dominated by love of God, there will be a corresponding desire to seek and approve what is excellent. Why? Because that true love is controlled by the deep knowledge of the Word, which enables the Christian to be completely discerning, and discriminating, and that leads, to a, leads him to an, uh, a pursuing of that what is excellent. That is, that is the process by what happens in us. That's why he says that ye may prove th the things that are excellent. You can't do it without a general love that attitude that commits to what the Bible calls a biblical love. Now the, now the word approved there is a very interesting word and is very familiar in the New Testament. It was used in classical Greek as associated with metal and determining the properties and the purities of that metal. It is used in testing money to be sure that it is not or was not counterfeit. 
In Luke chapter 14 and verse number 19, it's, it is used to test the quality of animals, namely an ox. In Luke chapter 12 and verse number 56, it is used to assess uh, the state of the sky or to analyze the weather. And it has to do with testing or verifying or to prove or to determine something. And what he is saying here is that my prayer for you is that you have the capability to evaluate and determine things that are excellent. The Greek word literally means to differ. Referring to the things that are excellent. In other words, so you would know the difference between things. That you may be, determined, uh, be able to determine what is important. The ideal is that, that, that we have a set uh, values before us of the valuable things. What is valuable and what is not valuable. What is more valuable and what is most valuable. What is worthless and what is vital. What is excellent and what really doesn't matter. Now, I want you to listen carefully because I want you to understand that what it, the, it is not distinguishing here that, it, that we're distinguishing between that which is good and that which is bad. It is not talking about being able to determine what is good and what is bad. Because in reality, everybody can determine that. Everybody can determine what is good and what is bad. We're, it, is, it, is, it is that we're determining what is good and what is better. And only a few are able to assess that. The distinguishing of assessing is... Is the most important value of a Christian's life. Being able to take your life and focus your time and your energy on what really matters. Proving what is excellent. Testing it, assessing it, proving it what is most sufficient. What is most significant. The ability to be able to separate is, and to assess separates us or gives us the, the ability to separate the simple from the profound. That which is weak from that which is powerful. That which is common from that which is influential. These profounding, powerful, influential people are those people who had the ability to focus their lives on some excellent goal. And they are not distracted by anything except to achieve that excellence. Now, this prayer is a prayer of the mind. You might say the first prayer was a, a prayer, the prayer of love was a prayer of the heart. But this is a prayer of our mind. Because we cannot pursue that what is excellent unless we are able to assess what is excellent. It is the, the charge of having the ability to pursue that which is most noble or best. Most people are like the proverbial bouncing ball that just react. They just do whatever impulse or emotion or mood tells them to. And that's how the world is. They don't want to think about it. They just do. And they don't have to approve what is excellent. Because they have no control of their mind. Because their emotions control their mind. And they just react. Somebody said, most of society is 
on a caboose looking backwards. And they just see what goes by. It reminds me of the story that I, that I read as I was studying of a pilot. He came over a loudspeaker, and the pilot said, I have some good news and bad news. The bad news is we've lost all our instruments and don't know where we are. The good news is that we have a tailwind and are making great time. And that is the life of most people. That shows how we relatively are. But a Christian, if we're going to pursue excellence, we cannot be victims of our emotions or our moods. If we're going to pursue that what is excellent, we must renew our mind. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter number 12 and verse number 2. It says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that which is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. You've got to renew your mind. You have to get your thinking in order. That's why in Philippians chapter 4 says, in verse number 8, it says, Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, and whatsoever things are honest, and whatsoever things are just, and whatsoever things are pure, and whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. It starts with your mind. You've got to get beyond reaction of your mood and your emotion. Ephesians chapter number 5, Paul tells us that we're to walk as children of the light and learn how to please God, learn how to please the Lord. Verse number 15 of chapter number 5, listen to what it says. It says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. See, Christian character at its highest level is a divine implanted and growing love controlled by truth and wisdom that is therefore pursued with a determining uh, distinguishing of what is most excellent. That is what we're to pursue in our life. And yet most people will spend their whole life reacting to what is bouncing around and doing whatever their mood it dictates them to do, and they accomplish nothing that lasts. Because they never learn to distinguish what is that excellent thing. Whereas the truth of godly character characterizes by love and pursuing of excellence is what we're to do. Now, I, I, want you to, I, want, I want to give you this right here because we're fixing to close. The question of the, the thought of what's been given to us is this right here. What are you pursuing in your life? What is that that, that, that holds your captive? What is that that you focus on? Where is your, your excellence found? We live in a world that's a day of compromise. We'll watch a television program and we'll say, well, it, it's not as bad as some. 
We'll permit things to be seen in our lives and go in our minds, and, we, and, and we'll, we'll do nothing about it because of the fact that it's enjoyable to us. Learning to choose that which is not good, but that which is best. Is the is the the pursuit of a Christian? It comes from a love that is inside of us. Why do we want to pursue that which is excellent? Because of the love of God. Because we love God. We're God's people. Loved by God. I really have a hard time for someone that says that, that uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm born again, I'm, I'm going to heaven, but I, I, I don't like reading the Bible. I don't like being around Christians. They condemn me. They, 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 I feel like they're judging me. I, I, don't like being, I, don't, I don't like going to church. There's a problem there because those that, that are gods love God. They love God's things. Their desire is to pursue what God desires for them to pursue. And the pursuit of a Christian is not to be like the world, but to be different. To pursue that is what is excellent. We don't choose the good. We choose the best. We're not looking for the better. We're looking for the best. That's the pursuit of our life. So in our life, we're, we're constantly looking at what is there and what is better. My desire for you is to examine your life and what are you pursuing? To say I want to be that or to do that is one thing, but to, to look at our lives and see what we're actually choosing. Are we choosing what is good? Or are we choosing what is best? That is the distinguishing difference. That is what Paul's prayer is for the church at Philippi. Philippi. That is what is the, 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 the prayer for the church of today should be. That we not choose that which is good, but we would excel to choose that which is best. Can I tell you, choosing what is best isn't always what is best for you. But what is best for others. John uh, was talking about a debate that he did, or not a debate, but a lecture that he gave on drinking. On drinking and getting drunk. He said drinking was sin, and some, one of the judges wrote on the back of the card, have you talked to the pastor? So he thought he'd come in, he talked to the pastor. So he asked me, he said, is drinking sin? And I said, well, drinking... In the word of God, I believe it's sin, but probably for not the same reason you believe it's sin. Because the Bible permits that, that, that if someone is dying, that, they could, that, that you can give them a drink uh, of, of alcohol to be able to soothe his passing. And then the Bible tells us that if, the, if you're if your stomach, for the stomach's sake, that you can take an alcohol. Now, some people will say that they would debate that that word's not alcohol, but from my study, I believe that it says that it is. But I believe that the reason that it is a sin is because of the fact that the Bible says that we're not to place a stumbling block before our brethren. And for that fact, we should never do it because people are falling because of it. 
The Bible says he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. And if we know that our brothers are falling because of that, it is sin for us to partake of it before that very fact. So if we choose to do it, we choose not the excellence. We're choosing maybe that what we feel is good, but not the excellence. See, our choice of life is when we choose that which is greater than that what would be commonly chosen. And that's what we've been called to do. That's what we are to pray for each other to be able to do. To choose that which is excellent. What are you choosing in your life? And does that choice reveal the glory of God? Let's stand together. Father, I do thank you for your word. And I thank you for your goodness, your grace. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us today. Lord, I know that um, we only covered a short little bit, but Lord, there's so much here that is, needs to be in our life that I didn't want to cloud it with anything else. Lord, it is true that your word tells us that our lives are a choice. God, I pray that our pursuit of life would be to pursue those things that are excellent. Lord, for those brethren that are here and those that have viewed this, Lord, that they would pursue that what is excellent not what is good. Lord, I pray that you would have your will. I love you and thank you for all you do for us. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.